My name is Paul De Cavallo. I'm General Manager of Three Mills Studios, a lovely little island of creativity in East London, but I'm here to help facilitate uh, the most fantastic session uh, that you would have seen today. Uh, the nominees, BAFTA nominees, just happen to be the Oscar nominees also for 2008 for uh, Best Production Design. I've lost track of how many nominations, awards, etc. the panel has uh, been, uh, has won or been nominated for, so I'm not gonna go into them. What I am gonna do is ask East panelist to introduce themselves, the film uh, or films that they are nominated for. Then we're going to watch um, uh, uh, those relevant clips, maybe get a few words uh, from each one uh, after each clip, and then we'll jump into the session. Uh, we certainly want to leave time for questions at the end. I'm going to keep my questions to the minimum, hopefully just keep things rolling along with this fantastic panel. So let's start with the self-introductions. Starting with me. Yes. Um, okay, I'm uh, Sarah Greenwood, production designer of Beauty and the Beast and Darkest Hour. I'm Katie Spencer, set decorator of Beauty and the Beast, Darkest Hour. We're going to jump right now to those, right. is my understanding, before we do. So everyone links it in. Father's place. Come into the light. Show me the girl. Look at her. What if she is the one? <gasps> the one who'll break the spell. Hello. You can talk. Well, of course he can talk. Hello. Pleased to meet you. The master's not as terrible as he appears. I say we kill the beast! Think of the one thing you've always wanted. Now find it in your mind's eye and feel it in your heart. Them see your true qualities. My poor judge. You know, your sense of humor. Ho, ho, ho. Your Majesty. Mr. Churchill, I invite you to take up the position of Prime Minister. He's an actor in love with the sound of his own voice. You need to reply to the Lord Privy Seal. I am sealed in the Privy. Now I can only deal with one shit at a time. <laughs> a bottle of champagne for lunch, another one at dinner. Here's to not buggering it up. Not buggering it up! We are looking at the collapse of Western Europe in the next few days. You ask what is our aim? Victory at all costs! You're suggesting we're somehow winning. We're not. Is it true we're in full retreat? All our forces are now in Dunkirk, where we cannot reach them. They're pushing us into the sea. There is a question of peace talks between ourselves and Germany. Europe is still... Europe is lost. The child. You have the full weight of the world on your shoulders. How many men will survive? Go to the people. Tell them the truth. We must rouse to an heroic resistance. There's nothing patriotic in fighting to the end. Now is the time to negotiate. When will the lesson be learned? You cannot reason with a tiger! 
when your head is in its mouth. I take full responsibility. Really? Really, yes, sir. It is the reason I sit in this chair. Be yourself. Myself. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing ground. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender! For without victory, there can be no survival. Production designer, uh, Blade Runner 2049. Let's go. Uh, Nathan Crowley, uh, Dunkirk, production designer.
you going to do on the uh, Paul Osterberry, Shape of Water, and uh, Jeff Melvin's out there, set decorator. Oh, wow. <laughs> If I told you about her, the princess without voice, what would I say? Clean that lab, you get out. This may very well be the most sensitive asset ever to be housed in this facility. You may think that thing looks human. Stands on two legs, right? But we're created in the Lord's image. You don't think that's what the Lord looks like, do you? This creature is intelligent, capable of language, of understanding emotions. looks at me, he does not know how I am incomplete. He sees me as I am. The natives in the Amazon worship this like a god. Get him out. What are you talking about? No. We need to take it apart, learn how it works. I don't want an intricate, beautiful thing destroyed. We can do nothing. I'm sorry. Don't do this, Eliza. What is she saying? Don't do this. Oh, God, it's not even human. If I told you about her, what would I say? I wonder. So I tight race, obviously, BAFTAs, Oscars, good luck to you all. Um, I'd like to start off just um, talking uh, about Dunkirk and Darkest Hour in particular, uh, around the topic of research and the process of production design, inspiration in particular about recreating historical locations. Some went to the historical <laughs> location, uh, others interpreted the historical lo location. Nathan, do you want to start? With uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, this is a very different design job than I usually do with Christopher Nolan. It was, you know, trying to find somewhere to start was, was difficult beyond the research. So um, we, early on, we just thought, let's go to Dunkirk. So we went to Dunkirk, a little bit incognito for him. No one knows who I am. <laughs> but he just wore a T-shirt and shorts like a summer vacation. And it was like, oh, who are you? But um, we went there and walked. Our research was walking 18 miles. We walked the entire beach cause, and realized that event took place over this vast space from Belgium, 26 Ks in. Uh, and so we walked 18 miles and talked it through. And we sort of, as the tide went in and out during that entire day, we, we sort of arrived back at the East Mole, which is where most of the troops got off that didn't exist anymore and realized we didn't really have any choice uh, and we were making this sort of, we were going to make this practically. We, we just had to shoot it in Dunkirk. There was, for the film we were going to make, there was no faking it. So, which was, which was again, one of those moments I always have on a film, which was just like, oh my God, we have to, we have to try and <laughs> do this event and <laughs> we have to do it for real. Um, so it's always sort of that, the, the optimism you need to start a film is, is very important. We're going to come back to you in terms of scale later. Yeah. But Sarah, you had a different approach with, with um, Darkest Hour. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, Darkest Hour, interestingly, we knew that Nathan and Christopher Nolan were making Dunkirk, and there was a lot of, you know, conversations, and it was kind of like, well, whatever they're doing, they're doing in their way, and we will not be doing that because apart from anything else, our budget was like quite yeah, small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, <laughs> but also the, the 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 script, you know, it was it was it was a very kind of internal. It was a very kind of cerebral, and it was just it was it was something much more about it, it kind of it was kind of the underbelly of what was going on. And you know what was interesting was the script. You know, the script started off as something. It was a bit grey men in grey rooms. There was a lot of chat and you know didn't seem to go out anywhere but obviously knowing joe and the way joe works you know that we can we you know we could bring some life to it um with you know, ways of interpreting it and um and also unlike i mean interestingly talking about the kind of the, the realism and you know the they, these are real real people not characters they're real people you know Churchill, our centre, you know, he was real, as real as it goes. I mean, you look at Gary's performance, you look at that amazing prosthetics, you look at his costumes, his kind of artefacts and all of that. And so at the heart of it, you have this incredibly real thing. But around it, it's the essence of it. It's the, it's the feeling of that we wanted to create about the war. We were not looking at verbatim recreation because, you know, we couldn't afford it it wouldn't have been necessarily the right thing. We were looking for the atmosphere of kind of, kind of de desperation and coming out of the depression. Um, and also, I, for me, I like the idea of this counterpoint to two films, the, the Downfall and Valkyrie. And they are fantastic films that kind of showing how the Nazis were approaching things. You know, that there was this massive war machine that was just rolling through Europe. And, you know, what we were with this kind of completely unprepared, you know, the way we were doing it was so kind of wrong, you know. And, and so there we were, you know, we ended up in this bunker with string and pins. And that was literally how they won the war. And, you know, to try and kind of convey that was... Uh, it was very ad hoc, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And the, the whole of the mat room down there in the bunker was very ad hoc. If yeah. they ran out of chairs, it was, who's got a spare chair at home? Can somebody bring something in? Yeah. And this is the last country fighting the Nazis. Yeah. And, so. you know, it's, it's, it was, it, and it was, you know, so they thought, oh, we'll be safe underneath, you know, Whitehall. And then they realised, oh, maybe not. If a bomb lands on the war office above, it'll just collapse on top of them. So they brought in these naval architects who stuck in these wooden pillars, you know, because that's all they could do. Yeah. And it was just like, you know, how kind of weirdly planned. Yeah. Very British. Not, very British, yeah. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah badly planned. Because <laughs> I did read something where you say, we're not a documentary, and in yeah. Counterpoint to Dunkirk as, as well, you know, you're the politics and the intimate detail to their action and, and scale. Yeah. And how do you, how do you see that, Nathan? No, I mean, we... we I mean, let Chris, you know, he always invites me to lunch and, and, <laughs> and, and he gives me a script and it, it's like, and usually it's 186 pages long and I'm a slow reader. It's like, oh my God, my day. <laughs> this one was 46 pages. It's like, it's like what do you, he said, we're going to do something different. We're going to make an event. We're going to, we, we need to put people in this place because there's plenty of great war films uh, that have been made uh, and we have to do our version of it. And we have to explain our uh, things are air sea land. So yeah, I mean, once we sort of got a flavour of Dunkirk, we were going to Dunkirk. We use real Spitfires, we use real destroyers. So we, you know, the research was uh, was already there. So our themes were the sort of brutalism of that place and how you, you know, you, you were in this sort of Groundhog Day thing. You couldn't get off. You got if you managed to get onto a ship, it was sunk or torpedoed. It was night. There was no way out. And um, you know, and it was about the sort of desperation and and uh, you know and how how these people survived to fight another day and um, the French, you know, you, the, the, the France had fallen. You know, they were supposedly supposed to be going on the boats too. It was this sort of great disaster. And the, the reason I the thing I like most, most proud of, is we landed that Spitfire in Dunkirk Beach with Dunkirk markings. And it was just, we had trouble getting it off, but... You said far too. Can I ask you about the Spitfires? Because I, I was reading you found some Spitfires that were Mark Fives or whatever, but, you know, at the beginning of the war they were Mark Ones or something. Yeah. So in terms of accuracy and, and detail, 
what did you do when you talk? You just talked about Dunkirk marking. I was, uh, you know, I sort of, as we were sort of finding the film, the reason it was a slightly different film because it was hard to find design themes. Um, you know, I went to Duxford and I looked at the Spitfire. They pulled out the sand of Dunkirk, and it was like that's our Spitfire. And you know, you know, people are like they refused to come. So we had some great Texan who owned two Mark Ones and a Mark Five. So he he flew. Uh, he flew, uh, most Spitfires are Mark 1s, apart from one of them, which we changed from a Mark 5 to a Mark 1. But the hardest thing, you know, was, there was a, I mean, we used a two-seater Yak, which is a Russian warplane, war and we put cameras on the wings, but we had to rebuild the Spitfire cockpit in the front seat, so the flyer, the pilot can be in the second seat, so a lot of the flight stuff is, is IMAX strapped to, cap, you know, over Dunkirk with Spitfires flying alongside, so you know, trying to get experimental planes through and ships to be towed, and you know, so this this our research was finding the real elements. Uh, Shifting then to scale and the real elements, you rebuilt the mole, a mile of. We didn't rebuild a kilometer. We, I of course, decided I wanted to rebuild the <laughs> kilometer, and, and Chris looks at me like well, you're mad. So, <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. It was this, it was a, the first key image was this uh, kilometer long, seven foot six white pier that goes to nowhere. And uh, it was just pure white. And the reason it was white so fishermen could see it. Uh, and I thought that was a great image. And literally soldiers just stacked up waiting to be rescued and being bombed. In fact, no single German shell actually hit them all dead on. So um, it was too narrow. Uh, so it was, to rebuild that was, uh, but this film was really the most logistical film. It was very difficult with the weather. at 21 foot tide, so I just logistically coming up with a plan to stack a 21 foot mole. So we ended up doing 700 feet, which was, which was plenty. So, um, <laughs> uh, and we didn't actually, we had some decent money, but we didn't have much money considering what we were trying to do. Um, uh, so yeah, so, but really, for me, visually, I didn't. I sort of discovered the industrial side of Dunkirk, which I became very in, yeah, interested in. Uh, for our, we had our things were air sea land, so the land was. I wanted to really that industrial beach. I was very keen to get out of uh, the seafront and this sort of traditional French boulangerie cafe thing, <laughs> and get us into the industry because I felt that represented the more hard edged dare I say, sort of modernist machine look that I felt was important, that they kept on coming back to this. There was no niceties. They kept on coming back to this horrible place after every attempt to get off it. So uh, it was hard to get off that beach. We weren't even being shot at. So. <laughs> <laughs> Staying with the theme of, of scale then, Dennis, and Blade Runner 2049, where I understand you built... 90% of the sets physically and big, big sets in big, big places. Yes. <laughs> um. And so what, what led to that decision? Well, the, uh, you know, we only had one reference uh, to, to try and do an homage or, well, a continuation, really, uh, of a film that was made, uh, you know, 35 years ago. And and why it took so long, you know, that's another story. But the, the, I said we have, a, I said we have one advantage. Uh, we, we did have more money than Ridley had at that time. But also, uh, he was, he broke the ice uh, uh, with really one, one big set uh, at Warner Brothers, which I was lucky enough to see. And, uh, and I had met really at that time, at that time, because I was a, a beginning designer, and and I saw the complications they had. So I said to Denis, uh, one of our director, I said, "Well, we have to stand alone, but continue, you know, uh, the journey. And I think scale is going to be a real, real important thing for us, um, metaphorically. Uh, the the nature of 
Los Angeles uh, the way really created it, and then and then growing on top of that 35 years later with the uh, with the brutality that we intended uh, gave us, uh, and also the weather, the compa compounded with the the brutalness of the weather was. Uh, we needed to have a bigger scale. It's like the pyramids. We needed to build the pyramids uh, to withstand uh, the elements. And so that was the real reason for the scale, I think. And, we, and it was a stage-based movie. We went to Budapest, Hungary to make it. Ridley had done The Martian there, and he suggested that London had no stages for us. So we, we, uh, I was a little hesitant about it until I went there, and I kind of fell in love with Budapest. It was really, I thought there's some, something to offer here. I'm not sure yet what. But in the course of uh, designing the film, we, uh, we discovered there were some elements that we couldn't build on stage. And, uh, and we folded those in to, uh, uh, to the scale issues and so on. So it was a... Yeah, Both of you guys have mentioned um, the brutalism and brutality. Yeah. Uh, can you fill us in a, a bit about, you know, in talking to your directors, you know, the words that you used together to try and uh, come up with the initial ideas. And, and Paul, please jump in uh, there. But I... Our word is love in our movie, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love and yeah. harmony. In, con in contrast to that, yeah, well, brutality was, I, I asked Denny, I said, what's, if you could describe the movie in one word, uh, and I do this often with directors, say, well, we need to find something to hold on to. And let's, so let's synthesize it to kind of create a rule out of uh, the idea. And uh, he came back very quickly. I said, brutality. Uh, and I said, fantastic. It, it, uh, it, so how do you create something that's quite brutal, but then also um, the, to contrast it so that it's just not so, uh, so it has to be somewhat uh, forgiving as well, too, in a sense, because you've got kind of a romance going on. You've got all these, these different images and, and different emotions that are being played. You know, a, a, uh, you know, a potential, potential you know, <laughs> son, to son to a father and all of these, uh, these issues that the, the underlying aspect of the film, which um, is very much the way Ridley was kind of playing it and what, the way Denny thought we could, we could arrive at something that uh, was interesting, and, uh, and so that brutality was the, the word, but how do you make something brutal, uh, brutal beautiful? Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's Roger Deakins <laughs> in the lighting. We'll come back to that, um, the lighting and, and stuff later. And uh, Sarah, Katie, do you want to throw in some, some words for either or both of, of your films when working uh, on Beauty and the Beast and, uh, and Darkest Hour? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, you're always looking for the keys in, the ways yeah. in. And uh, I think for Beauty and the Beast, the weird one, which will send shivers down the spine of some of our colleagues who are here, is a Rococo, which is um, <laughs> this kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, mad kind of design kind of element from, I don't know, 1740s 17th, France. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's not so brutalist, is it? It's not so brutalist. It's <laughs> quite kind of fancy, really. <laughs> Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so, um, so that became quite brutal, actually, um, <coughs> really, with Rococo. Yeah. But, yeah. For those who were drawing it. For yeah. those who were drawing yeah. it and having to deal with it. Like, uh, yeah. um, were you listening to what we were doing? So okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and and Darker Sow? Well, I, think, I suppose they're both, I mean, um, I suppose they're both in a way about survival and getting through it and resignation and all of that, but... Um, uh, Dark Star's challenges were different, very different, because um, economically it was challenged and we were all over the country and uh, on a very tight schedule. Um, Joe's quite a sort of, you know, demanding director as well. He's brilliant to work with and work for, but... Um, pedantic. Ped pedantic is a word that <laughs> my friend here is saying. It's um, not recorded. I didn't it? say it, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said he was lovely. <laughs> You're lovely, Joe. Lovely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> I'm in a mix of a flu fog here. 
So I'll get other people talking. Paul, I want to, um, you to lead, please, on a, on a question we've always been, uh, we've all been talking about uh, outside is colour palette. And uh, uh, maybe that could be uh, something that you and Jeff might like to delve into a bit more deeply in, in terms of uh, the shape of the water and uh, shape of water and how you dealt with that and working with Guillermo on, on that. I can comment a bit about brutalism. We, it, does, it does work for our film as well yeah. because we have this romantic side, this um, sort of late Victorian, old, decrepit uh, um, architecture of her apartments above this old movie theater. And we wanted to contrast that with brutalism. And I used the ar architectural style of international brutalism, which yeah. was very prevalent in the 50s, 60s, 70s and, and for institutions. And so there was a, we wanted the very harsh differences between the two, the two settings, her home and her work life. And we chose a brutalist building in Toronto. And then we based that the style of that architecture, we took in interior to all the studio sets. We were, mm, I would say, like 75% studio, 25% location. For a very small movie, we did a very, quite a lot of building. Um, so brutalism does work in, in context of our, our, our movie about love and acceptance and everything as well. But color palette is very, very strong in the film. And Guillermo, uh, I, I've only worked with Guillermo, finished one film with Guillermo. I've been working on three films with him over the past three years, but uh, only one has been uh, seen it through. And, uh, I think it was a good one, thankfully. <laughs> but uh, but he the, the first thing, the first day I came into the office, I mean, we had been talking about this film for a year because I had the script, a, a rough draft, a year prior to that in 2015. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we came to the office with, I had 10 weeks, but my art director came in with eight weeks of prep. And when we actually had the office, the first day was pull out the big Benjamin Moore catalog. You know, he has an idea in his mind about where the color was going to be anyway. So we just quickly spent... 45 minutes just tagging, going through all little color swatches, tagging them all, and just assigning them to different characters. And then Lewis, the costume designer, did exactly, we did exactly the same thing with his uh, fabric swatches. And then we had, the, well, that was maybe 100 colors. And so then I narrowed it down to about 40 colors and stuck them on a board. And the, the Lewis did the same with his, and then we made each other boards. And so we had them in our office. And you know, my background as an architect, color is not generally uh, the, the strong point of architectural training. So, I always have, a, I always, I'll be the first to admit, I struggle with, I agonize over the color. It takes me a lot longer than the three-dimensional space. But because, because Guillermo had kind of had an idea in his head, and, and not all directors do about color. I mean, this is very, very lucky. So he, he already kind of narrowed the world down. So then, for me, it was very easy then to pick the colors because I had, a, we'd already narrowed it down, and then I could just refine it. And then, again, with Jeff for uh, uh, furnishings and things, we knew we're, well, with furnishings, we could actually obviously recover things and stuff like that, but essentially everything was color blocked. You know, we knew what colors were going to be for each particular character, and essentially, in the broad strokes, you know, uh, the aqua tones and the underwater colors were basically Eliza's apartment um, in her world. And you contrast that with the, the opposite side, which is Giles' apartment, which was very earthy, um, uh, mustards, golds, warm, warm color. And it was also in conversations with Dan Lauston, the DP, he lit. He lit Eliza's apartment with steel blue gels and kept it a cool palette. And then on the other, in the contrasting other side of the hallway, uh, was always lit like golden hour, even though it was, it was golden hour seemed to last all day long. But anyway, he lit it like golden hour all the time. And all the other empathetic characters in the story, um, Zelda and um, Hostetler, who's this Russian spy who you wouldn't think is empathetic, his world we created in that same warm palette, just so that you know that was that team empathy, you know, had that color. And then, and then. Getting back to the brutalism, when we went into Strickland's uh, lab where he was based out of, um, you know, I kind of wanted that to be on purpose. We chose uh, brutalism because it was harsh, um, harsh concrete uh, materials, and then his I put his office elevated because he looked down on everyone. He always felt everyone was beneath him. He talked down to them and was really abusive. So we put him kind of above everybody, um, and he had this outside his world. There was this mural that we did this tile mural that was in the same teal colors um, that were teal was the color of the future by the way it's in the script when he's buying a car the salesman pitches teal is the color of the future so Guillermo has color written into his script in this case and so we we basically everything was basically monochromatic concrete but we had this teal teal theme throughout that whole uh, lab complex so that was kind of the basic um, color um, design that we had for the for the film it's pretty simplistic but it was you know um, color-coded. 
and BAFTA has tried to uh, replicate this. Yes, I know. Uh, I'm in the wrong you. seat. We'll call it Teal <laughs> yeah. and Cerise, uh, something like that. <laughs> While you've been oh. yeah, chatting, Paul, there's yeah. been some uh, slides um, going on here, and maybe you could oh, talk that's to... that's my art director. He was being... He wasn't a very good asset, but he was trying to, sub, you know, <laughs> posing as the uh, creature. You know, basically, we, we do a lot of stuff in... I draw a lot of things in SketchUp, and then my team... There's a big team, you know. It's not just us who are sitting up here. There's a huge team, or in this case, not that big a team in this movie, but... and then. Um, this is some of the progress of the particular set. If we can just hold that there, because you know, again, <clears throat> I you know the uh, the asset is a god in South America, and I was reading you know, the the pool is designed on uh, a pyramidic shape, and even the the pipes are like a setting sun, or so you, yeah. those sorts of things you permeate the whole the whole. Yeah, part. there's little details in there. Guillermo has a sketchbook, and he had. He had a sketchbook when he, when he was imagining the creature being found in the Amazon that he emerges out of the water and there was a sunset behind him, you know, like a setting sun. He's like this godlike creature in the Amazon. So when we were, the first time we see the creature emerge, not in a tank, but emerge out of the water, is in, is in this pool, this above ground pool. And so I said it, I kind of thought, I'll take the archetypal ziggurat form of a stepped pyramid. A lot of civilizations did that, and it's a very stylized little simple, simple one. He would pop out of there, and then Guillermo said, let's, and we were going to do some pipes back there. And he said, well, let, maybe let's try to keep, somehow do a, a version of that setting sun that he had in his mind from, from his little sketchbook. So we did sort of this steampunk version of, of this, this pipes. And going back to research, by the way, in, you know, at the very, very beginning, to the, even though it's a fantastical Guillermo del Toro sort of movie, we, um, we started with serious research because we really wanted to set the period as early 60s. That was important. And then, you know, after, after you look at this, obviously we pushed it a lot, but, but we wanted to ground ourselves in that period so that, that that was done and then we could push it from there. So research is important in, in any kind of movie, I think. Mm -hmm. Great, well let's um, jump back there then in, in terms of color palette, might um, uh, jump back to you, sir, and, and, and Katie on, uh, on Beauty and the Beast, which when I saw it, especially you, Love, being brought up on musicals, uh, my mother's desire for musicals, and uh, I sort of saw it as, you know, colour pushed up to 11, you know, uh, but fantastic, the flower scene and, the, and all that sort of stuff. Do you want to talk a bit more about colour in, in Beauty and the Beast? There's a lot of it. Yes, a lot of <laughs> it. In the village as well. Yeah. yeah, and that's working closely with Jacqueline, costume yeah. designer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was for a small, quiet village, it was quite busy. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, so that was that was. But that's in the song as well. You have to yeah. follow what what they're singing. So and Bill's idea of, of a small village, he really just didn't get it actually, because <laughs> he's a New Yorker born and bred, and just like anyway. So uh, uh, yeah, that was an inter that was an interesting set anyway, because we were originally going to go and shoot that on location, and I quite like the idea of shooting it on location as a contrast to the fact that when we go into the Enchanted World, everything is yeah. you know is is. Is, was built is built, um, and that you know the, the the real world had 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 a reality to it. But obviously, um, studios come at you with budget and logistics and say, okay, Sarah, it will cost. We, so we found some fantastic locations in France, um, and it came back with a lot of information. And they said, right, this is how much it'll cost to take the whole kit and caboodle to France. If we gave you this, can you build it? And then by then we were well into production. It was like it was like starting a new film on the back lot with a new construction team and everything. And of course, what's not to like? Build a French village, an 18th century French village. I mean, it's like wow, this is an amazing opportunity. So, you know, and then and then you know it just kind of it all just kind of happened really. Um, it got bigger. Um, but interesting, interesting color. It's it's kind of like it's it's the the color. The colour, there isn't one particular colour, I don't think, with Beauty and the Beast. It's more, it's the style, actually. It's, it's, it's going back to, you know, finding how you can do the enchantment. And it's finding that key. And that was literally Rococo. And I'm, I'm not being facetious this time. You know, so, so Rococo, this style of um, exuberant, kind of fanciful design, very asymmetric. And what I found was two etchings, one which was a pretty pure piece of Rococo, and another one which was like Rococo gone mad. It was like somebody had like done something to it. And they were both of kind of mirrors and fireplaces, and it was just excessive. And that's what struck me, because you know, in the enchantment, it's this feeling that it carried on moving and carried on growing, and that every time a petal fell, some part of the castle just twisted a bit more. And um, so it was, it was like it, we didn't want it to be damp and derelict and green and overgrown. 
it was just kind of heaving and kind of moving. I mean, it was incredible, the Rococo, because it, it transferred even to the, you know, the set of the Enchanted Woods and everything. Everything was carved in Rococo. Mm. The decoration on the, on the bell jar was carved for real in the Rococo pattern, the frost on the window. So that was really ran through everything mm. that was, had enchantment, didn't it? And then in uh, Darkest Hour, you... Still Rococo. Yeah, still Rococo. <laughs> but it seems to me, you know, even though it's in colour, uh, uh, having watched it, it's like, oh, it's almost in black and white, except you know, the green of the, mm. uh, in, uh, of the parliament and other things, particularly in, in the war rooms. But it was, but, uh, you know, was that something that you were trying to push through? Who was that? For? There was a photographer that we liked in particular, a kind of um, 19... 50s, late 50s photographer, late 50s, but um, and the quality of that mm. was the quality that we were looking at. It was Jacqueline and Bruno and what we were doing. And obviously it could be done in the grade and it could be done in, you know, in post and things, but it was like trying to capture that and also the classic photo. The classic, there's this classic, I think it, I don't know whether it's Cecil Beaton or not, but there's um, Ed, Edwina Mountbatten in all her glory leaning against a fireplace in some grand uh, house in London, but everything is shabby. She has the pallor of a smoker. Her, her, her makeup is a bit smeared. The, uh, you know, the, the fire's going out and the paint's chipped. Mm. And, and all I this, think that's what the we carpet's to. disgusting. Yeah. You know, so that, so that even, even, you know, at that time, even for the aristocracy, it was hard. And that was one of the things that we wanted to get across, which Katie's already talked about, you know, in Buckingham Palace, is the fact that, you know, everything that we did there, so this empty old house we shot in in Yorkshire, was very tawdry, hadn't been painted for 50, 60 years. But, you know, everything that Katie brought in with the furnishings, so, you know, the, the, instead of going for gold, you know, you went for kind of five points down, you know, so everything that we did was just right sat down and, you know, we stuck up these huge kind of envision bomb blast shutters at the window. So, you know, poor old Bruno's lighting opportunities were getting smaller <laughs> and smaller. <laughs> he was amazing, wasn't <laughs> Bruno? Yeah, Bruno yeah. was fantastic, yeah, so, you know, so which, of course... You know. So the palette isn't a palette as such, it's a, it's a quality of tonal kind of mood, I suppose. There we go, it's all about the mood. And Dennis, <laughs> uh, in, in Blade Runner then, a strong colour palette again? Well, it's kind of a lack of colour in some way. You know, the, I designed the film originally just all in black and white, and then slowly we started to add colour into it to try and find the rhythm of... Uh, of the sequencing of the of the story, and, um, and the producer said, "Where's the color? Where's the color? Where's the color? I said, it's coming! It's coming! <laughs> you know, it's coming! It's coming!" Because it was like they were so nervous about the lack of it, because it, it's a, it was a dark environment in a lot of ways, and um, of course the the when the choice of for Vegas was was this wonderful kind of muted orange that uh, we'd seen a, a research picture of the. Sydney, uh, Australia, that had this amazing storm coming off the off the uh, off the desert, yeah. and all of Sydney w was this this color. It was so magical, and it and then it justified the kind of the smart bomb that was initially put there to kind of uh, 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 take everybody away from Vegas, and then Harris justifying Harrison's existence uh, at that point, and then um, I mean the. Yeah, it was a it was a dark film. It was a dark film that uh, that, and I think it should should have been, you know, the uh, bringing the color in the uh, BB's bar was a, where where, uh, where Ryan uh, meets uh, uh, meets a couple of the girls that uh, carry the story on was uh, was probably the the most unique in, in the color palette as well too, uh, but. That was a bit of a homage back to the original film because that was the original uh, uh, set that Ridley had done with all the neon, and and that was the that's where the life of that uh, that that his film came, but uh, we needed to contrast that with the brutality. So, and and Nathan, the the darkness, the bleakness, the relentlessness of Dunkirk. I, I I sort of when when we work in that kind of world, I I, I mean I'm. I'm interested in contrast, so mm. that that's always key for me. Is I push contrast, so cinematography uh, it helps the cinematographer. So I, I I often like the white pier was an obvious contrast to the sea. We had this weird, we had such big weather come at us. That weird foam was hit us for a is week. That real? 
it looks like you know Dr. Shivago out there. So we <laughs> immediately ran to what I used to call the industrial beach, and the industrial beach was this uh, slightly not period beach, but it had all this sort of steaming industry. Like and we'd been looking at films like Red Desert and uh, Wages of Fear and Battle of Angiers, you know. So you know we we wanted that sort of mechanicalness that would enhance the ticking clocks. And we put all these ticking clocks everywhere. So it wasn't really about colors, it was about contrast. So mm -hmm. we had to find, one of the hardest things was that upside down hull, which is in the sea, about five miles out on the inland sea. Um, it was very hard to find enough contrast with that hull. Um, but luckily the, the moon, the boat, the white boat comes up to us. So you start, you fill the sky, the sea, uh, and, and these two elements. So. It, 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 it was always about contrast. There was, there was no color. Really. <laughs> I didn't bring my watch as a great moderator. Dennis, can you tell me the time? I can. Or are you set? Are you set on Toronto time? Time's up. Time's up. Four thirty. Oh well, we're going to keep going uh, for a little while, can we, Cassandra, for questions or not? Five, five minutes. I'm sorry, I took so much time. And but let, can we let me not. Uh, take any more time. Has anyone got any um, questions? Don't forget we have uh, Jeff here too, a set, set designer uh, for Shape of Water, if you'd like to ask any queries. Uh, anyone? Uh, we've got one here and then one at the very back and then one there, if you can remind me. Oh, we're going up the back first. Um, Hi, um, I wanted to ask Katie and Sarah um, about the significance of shooting in Westminster and uh, whether that was a challenge or, or, and how much you were able to do there. But yeah, we shot at um, the real Downing Street uh, and, uh, and the, the into, leading into the Treasury. And uh, quite frankly, that's just pure nepotism because um, uh, Eric Fellner, who was a very good friend of David Cameron's, and <laughs> got us in there before he got... Cameron got kicked out, and luckily Theresa May honoured the commitment of allowing us to film outside uh, outside Downing Street. That was that. That was that. We we built the we built the interiors elsewhere, but the uh, the exterior. I mean, it was great, and they showed us around, which was fantastic. Um, and then we shot in Westminster Hall, and we were offered, like I said, we were offered the House of Commons, but um, we couldn't sit down. So that's as much as we. <laughs> so you rebuilt that? So we rebuilt yeah, that, yeah. Right. yeah. And, and Downing Street, you're in Downing Street interiors, are not like Downing Street. No, Downing yeah, Street right. interiors are nothing like the real Downing Street um, because Joe, Joe, likes to, Joe likes to move a lot and he likes 360 environments and um, is quite kind of uh, ad hoc sometimes. And, and also one of the interesting things that we found out about Churchill was that he moved at a pace. And he moves really fast, which was interesting. Um, and uh, so, you know, there was a certain pace to it. And so we found this um, derelict house in, again, in Yorkshire, that they allowed us to do what we wanted to. So, so it has it has all the kind of feeling of Downing Street, but is nothing like Downing Street. Street. Yeah. There was someone down here with a microphone, was there, or someone in the I'm middle? The <laughs> Are we doing another one up the top? Is that, is that working? Great. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I was wondering, this is sort of for all of you, when you first get a script. What's the first thing you're looking for? It's to you, Dennis. Story. A good story that uh, you can hold on to. And uh, uh, it, 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 I think we were talked earlier about it. it's how do you get into a film? The, uh, and something has to, <coughs> to, to create that fire in you. you know, the, and that's, that's really what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that's, that's going to sustain uh, the passion throughout, uh, you know, the creative process and the shooting process. So, so it's, uh, it's simply that. And then, and then of course, you know, who's doing the work? You know, who, you know, who's your partner? I mean, in particular, you know, the uh, the director and the DP. You know, that uh, um, that is kind of the, the the foundation for me of the film. In that way, you know, how are we going to how are we going to uh, achieve all this madness? Okay, we're going to do with the original people who put their two. Oh, there's one here and, and one in the middle there. If we can quickly go there, and then I'm sorry, we're going to wrap. Okay. 
Um, in terms of the lavish indoor sets in something like Beauty and the Beast versus the large scale and scope of the outdoor sets, such as something in Dunkirk, what are the differences in your approach to each and in the challenges that you face with each of those? Um, I mean, the whole, interestingly, the whole thing about Beauty and the Beast was because this was a live action telling of the tale, um, the, the thing that struck me was that it had to be it had to be real because the beast wasn't real he was cg the the characters were real as in we made them and designed them but then they were animated and therefore if you'd built if you if this if the scenery around it had been um all kind of blue screen and things then what would have been real about the the whole process so so as far as that's why we built the sets that we built, and the, the nature of the beast of, is that it's um, it's an enormous castle, and you know, and and so therefore. Uh, I, I, our thing was, as we talked about scale, it was about you have to this thing, this event had four hundred thousand men stuck on a beach, and another hundred thousand French people fighting troops behind us. So it was about recreating that, and so scale was. Sort of everything. We have the IMAX camera. Chris always shoots on IMAX, um, and he he uses the native negative. So that means that if we scan it to do digital work on that negative, the output is a less quality. So we know we have to do some digital work. So what we have to do as much we have to affect the film as little as possible, and then project it. You know, you need to start with. You, you could interject uh, digital work along one scene, but you have to enter and exit. With reality, so so really the biggest, you know, as we talked about, the biggest challenges was maintaining the IMAX, the quality of the IMAX neg, so um, which is very important to him. So um, and he decided he, <laughs> I just remember him like he have his three piece suit on and just jump in the sea, just like we're going to get this done, and became this sort of beast. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's one one more here. Um. Congratulations to your wonderful work and nominations. I'm just wondering whether you have any different approaches and consideration when you're working on a film, which is both is going to be on 2D and 3D, and IMX, as you mentioned, some problems and how you're going to overcome it. Well, I've worked on a few 3D movies, and uh, essentially, you know, you cannot shoot quite as wide as you. Uh, well, it used to be you couldn't shoot quite as wide as you can now. If you shoot, by the way, there's a lot of movies that are shot in 3D and then movies that are just created in post in 3D. The ones I did were in real 3D. So definitely there was a, the, the camera setup is a lot bigger, so you have to allow for things like that. If you have a crane moving through something, the, the, the height I always had to figure out was you know, quite a lot bigger than a regular rig. And uh, you have to allow for a lot of, you can't have things too close to the camera because it, it messes up with your, your mind. But, there's certain things you learn by just doing it that you have to you have to adjust for. I don't know about <coughs> guys, if you've done three D movies, real three D movies. I, I don't think about it. <laughs> I don't I don't actually like three D movies, but but I have had to work on a couple of them. I did it in post on Beauty, and I think that's the only yeah. one we've ever done. Right. I think that shows how much I know about three well, D. Same for me. It's, it's always done usually in post. So. We're going to have to wrap it there, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to take the chairman's privilege to say one more quick question to each of you for, because uh, we know we have a lot of uh, younger production designers in the audience. Is your biggest challenge, number one skill needed? Start at that end. <laughs> <laughs> Deflect. <laughs> I think just a good work ethic and energy. You know, I mean, you can, I, I think as, a, as you're starting out as a designer on small, presumably you're on smaller things, You've got to do a lot. You've got to be really hands-on, and uh, and also just just work. I mean, I mean, people just wait and wait and wait. But I think sometimes you have to jump in, even if you're not designing. You just jump in and do other things, and you might find you learn a lot from doing other other um, disciplines within the film. Um, yeah, and don't don't be afraid. You can't have a fear of like if you have to paint a backing yourself and you've never done it. Do. Then by the way, you're going to have to do it. So, or you're going to learn how to do it. You have to. You have to be a jack of all trades. You've got to keep learning the whole time in this business. Yeah, so. I, did a, I did a movie a couple of years ago, a million and a half dollars, and, and I was the mechanic on set. I, I, had, I was the special effects guy doing the fireplace. You know, a lot of these things, I can do that in a union film, and I like doing those things, but I'm not allowed to, so it was, it was, our, it was kind of fun. 
Yeah, and you remember every film is new, so you, it's always the first time you've done it. So there's nothing, you, the amount of experience you have does <laughs> count, but it's still, we're as green as you guys. I, you know, I've never, you've probably never done Rococo before. I certainly haven't. <laughs> <laughs> never again either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you learn, it's about learning, it's the joy of learning, of learning like the place and the period, and you know, I, I find that. So, so just keep open minded. Mm. For, for me, it's fine. Again, I'll say it again. Just find a good story that you can be passionate about, and whatever it's going to take, you'll do it. You'll eventually find a way of doing it. Uh, you know, I've done uh, extremely small films and big films, and, 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 and it really doesn't matter as long as the story is there that drives you and keeps you keeps you going. Uh, it's a it's a twenty four seven business. You know, you once you're in it, you're in it. Yeah, I think that's true, and I think it is, you know, be prepared to sort of learn all the time, enjoy it, and talk to other departments all the time. I think that's a key thing, keep talking. Um, I actually think, you know, you, you have to love what you do, therefore, you, the people that surround you are absolutely critical, and your team, I mean, Katie and I were lucky enough, we've worked together for 20 <coughs> years, and we have an amazing team core team and people that come and go and you know you have to enjoy what you're doing because if you don't it's too hard a job to do without uh, you know kind of pleasure in it yeah, yeah absolutely you got a comment Jeff. don't think you can get away with it <laughs> Jeff you got a question great I think what you need to do is uh, someone once said to me this is how we do it, and this is how we should approach it, but there is no how we do it. Every film is different, every project's different, every story's different, so there's no rules. I think somebody said that, I'd agree 100%. If you put your best work out on each project, every show, whether it's a good show or a bad show, just do your best work all the time, you might end up there. I'll keep going, maybe I'll get from here to there. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you everyone. Thank you. Of course. Um, oh. <laughs> So it only remains uh, for me to say good luck. Thank you. Thank you.